Now, when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there. What did he hear about? Well, right before it says the death of John the Baptist. So he heard about the death of his cousin, and he's processing his own grief. So when Jesus heard this about the death of John, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd. And he had compassion for them and cured their sick. And when it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place and the hour is now late. Send them away. Send these crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. And Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. And then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up from heaven and he blessed and he broke the loaves and he gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. All eight were filled and they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Immediately he made the disciples get in the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking towards them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said to him, come. So Peter got out of the boat and he started walking on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, it would seem during the children's moment I had it reversed in terms of how many loaves or fish there were. So five and two, I knew it was that, but uh, got, that, got that mixed up a little bit. So what we have in this story, this sacred account of the life and ministry of Jesus. We have some of the most powerful moments of his time with crowds or with um, his disciples. The scripture teaches us that he was grieving, he was heavy of heart, and he needed to get out by himself to kind of process what it was that he was going through. Uh, Even in this ancient text, even Christ who lived so many centuries ago knew that when we go through tough times, we need to find a way to process it. Now, everybody, we're taught now, and we've learned from experts that we all grieve differently, we all process pain differently, and it's important for us not to pigeonhole you know, ourselves into, well, if you're not grieving this way, then it's not legitimate. No, it's just to know that you're hurt, you need to do something that helps you walk with that hurt for a while to know uh, what's next. But he was tired, and he, and he wanted to, to have that time alone to, to process through things and recharge. But there were people following him, people who needed him, people who were sick that needed healed, people who were discouraged that need in, needed encouraged. And they knew that this Jesus had been going through the hillsides and had just been doing miraculous things. And so they wanted to be connected to that because to connect with one who is doing great things in God's name is to connect with God. Even if they didn't understand he's the very presence of God with us, they wanted to be as close to God as they could possibly be. So, so they, they were chasing him. And isn't it interesting? He gets in the boat to go off by himself. They see him, and they outrun the boat. Did you pick up on that? They, they ran so fast out of the towns, people running through. The, the Messiah, Jesus, the teacher, the rabbi, however they were referring to him, they, they get there before him, and he, he's ready there, he's, he's depleted, he's really needing that time to recharge, and he steps off the boat, and there's the crowds. Hi. And he sees how badly they need him. So he doesn't say, nope, sorry. He says, okay, let's, uh, let's take care of this. 
So he stayed, he healed them, and he loved on them. And they, they were in this deserted place, and it was getting late, as Scripture tells us. And the disciples were freaking out. They're like, I, did you call the caterer? Who, who made the sandwiches? Do we have sandwiches? And I'm sure one of them looks at we have 5,000 people, plus women and children. Where are you going to get that many sandwiches? And he's like, well, why don't we just send them all back home? They ran here so fast, they can run back home real fast. So they go to Jesus, and they say, Jesus, please feed these people. Nope. They say, Jesus, tell them to go away. We don't have enough food for them. We don't have any food. And Jesus says, no. He says, they need not go away. You feed them. Jesus, you send them away. They don't need to go away. You feed them. Whoa, what? 5,000 men plus women and children are there to receive his teaching, to receive his healing. But there's something else going on in this moment. And that moment is saying that they are still bound by the customs of their day and their culture. Do you think it would bode well for the honor of someone who invited people by being the teacher? Jesus is also being the host, right? You invite people over. You provide them with the teaching, the healing, the moment, and then you're not able to feed them all. That would have been such an insult to them. That would have been such a smack in the face for their culture to have them and not be able to feed them all. So the disciples were trying to save face with their culture to say, we've got to get them out of here. This is going to look really bad on Jesus. So they came to him and said, you, you need to get them out of here. You say, we are now done with the teaching. You may now break for supper. Yeah, that's what you need to do. This is just one of these big you know, seminars, and that's what we're going to do. But Jesus says, no, I'm not worried about honor. Why don't you be in charge and come up with something for them to eat? Now the disciples, it was their honor at stake. Now they're really freaking out. We have already been dishonored by, by leaving our families and following Jesus. Now it's just what little standing we had in the community is going to be kaput. We're done. Jesus says, well, what do you have? And in essence, they said what the two kids said this morning. We have this little kid's sack lunch. Two pieces of fish and five loaves of bread. Now, have you ever seen a Middle Eastern loaf of bread? It looks more like a tortilla. It is not like, oh, whoa, we were at Panera, and they had this ginormous loaf. Look at this. This is delicious. It's so filling. When I have soup and this kind of bread, I am full for a long time. No, not that kind of bread. We're talking like you can almost see through it. There's a loaf. There's a loaf. And fish. Oh, these fish are great. They're just these sturgeon-looking things. No, nope, more like bluegill. Sorry. In fact, when you're in the Holy Land and you eat a fish out of the Sea of Galilee, um, it's called St. Peter's fish because he was a fisherman and that was the fish that they caught when they couldn't catch any fish and all that. It's called tilapia, about the size of a bluegill. Two tilapia and five tortillas. 5,000 plus hungry people. Now, we already talked about it, it doesn't matter how, why? Because Jesus wanted his disciples to understand that it was up to them to be courageous and trust God. You give them something to eat. So it doesn't matter for our purposes this morning with this text. It doesn't matter for us this day that he performed a miracle. It doesn't matter that the little boy had a sack lunch that he shared. What matters is that one of the greatest miracles of Jesus' ministry began with his disciples being asked to do the impossible. You give them something to eat. You see, they were afraid of failure. They, they were afraid that someone would go hungry and it would, look, it would look horrible. And the reputation of Jesus that was beginning to gain a lot of momentum, the, this, this reputation that was beginning to change things for these poor folks, the working poor, they were afraid that ministry would get derailed with their mistake. But see, being afraid kind of falls in line with both of these stories, doesn't it? I mean, you've got disciples afraid of failure uh, for the feeding, and then you've got Peter and the rest of the disciples terrified of a ghost. And then Peter afraid of waves. The fisherman was afraid of waves. I think there's more to Peter's story 
than what meets the eye. And we're going to spend the rest of the time on that this morning. So Jesus decides that he's going to, uh, to join them. He, uh, he comes to them, we hear from the Gospel of Matthew, in the morning, right? What happens in, during summertime? And you've got this really warm day and it heats, the sun heats the water up. And then the nighttime comes and that water gets cold, it cools down, and then the sun comes back up to start heating stuff up. As that change in temperature happens, what happens on the surface of that water? What? Fog. Mist. If it's not terrifying enough, with the shadows beginning to, to lengthen of, of night giving way to day, if it's not terrifying enough to see a figure walking toward you, Without the fog, can you imagine as a dark figure emerges out of the mist? Now, now don't think of you having your background and understanding maybe some, some things about science and technology and, and all that. I mean, think, put yourself in the disciples' shoes. That's a ghost. There's no doubt about it. First off, people don't walk on water. Second off, we can't see who it is. They're obscured by the mist. Also, in a metaphysical sense, the mist is always a reminder of the veil between this life and the next, which is why they thought it was a ghost coming out of the mist to haunt them, to booga booga them. I don't know what they were afraid of that that ghost would do to them. But at that point, when you're encountered by that sort of situation, do you ever think rationally? No, because it's a ghost. You're just scared of the unknown. You're scared of the potential danger that could be happening. Your boat has been rocked back and forth. You're probably a little seasick. And at that point, there is this figure coming out of the mist, and you wonder what on earth is going to happen next. Maybe Jesus thought, well, you know, all these guys do is sleep when I'm not with them. So they're probably sacked out on the boat. The boat's making its way. And I'm just going to slide into the boat. And because you know Jesus was a little bit of a trickster. You know he had a great sense of humor. So I'm just going to slide in. Because otherwise, why would he even walk on the water? He knew it was going to freak them out. He was probably giggling the whole way. He had his time. He recharged his batteries. He's ready to go. He's going to pull one over on the disciples. They're going to think I'm a ghost. This is going to be rich. So he's walking on the water. Slosh, slosh, slosh. The disciples are awake because the waves have been keeping them to and fro. And Jesus is thinking, I'm just going to slide in and they're going to wake up. and be like, hey guys, how you doing? How did you get here? No, that's not what happens. He comes through and, hey, it's a ghost. No, oh, don't be afraid. It's just me. The other disciples are like, that was good enough for them, right? Or they're still processing. Peter says, if it's really you... Tell me to get out of the boat and walk toward you. I don't know if he thought he was pulling one over on the ghost because the ghost wouldn't tell him to do that. I don't know what Peter was thinking, but for whatever reason. And then Jesus says, all right, come on. Again, it's not in your Bible, but I wouldn't be surprised if with a smile on his face. <laughs> come. <laughs> and Peter does, and he gets out of the boat. Do you realize how impressive that is? Because he's not convinced this isn't a ghost. He could be walking to his death. So he gets out and he, and he does it for a little bit and he sees the waves and fisherman waves just kind of starts to, to, to freak him out and he begins to sink. And as he's sinking, he says, Lord, help me. And Jesus grabs him and pulls him up and they walk together to the boat and they get in. And the rest of the disciples worship him. Jesus walks on the water. He fails. He begins to sink. Peter sinks like a rock. He's terrified. And because he is terrified, he fails, right? He fails. Let's read something else. Let's kind of pause that for a minute and then read over in Matthew 16, starting with verse 15. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, Shimon, Shimon, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven has. And I tell you, you are Petros, Peter. And on this, what? Rock. <gasps> There's a connection. And on this rock, I will build my what? Church. 
and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it, Matthew 16, 15 through 18. We think of Peter as, as Petros and, and, and rock, which it does. And rocks do what? When they come in contact with deep water, they what? They sink. Rocks sink. Rocks are meant to sink. That's the way they are created to be. When it seemed impossible to feed everyone, Jesus told the disciples, you feed them. When it seemed that the figure was a ghost, Jesus said, you come to me. When it was all on the line, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? All of these things that are so drawn together all have to deal with the fact that it was up to the disciples to make their own mind up. The disciples had to choose for themselves. Christ would not do it for them. He gave them some really good reasons and really good evidence to make their decisions, to base those choices. But he did not tell them, you must do this. He said, you do this, you do this, you do this. I will not make your choices for you. We think of all these disciples as choosing properly and that Peter eventually making up for his mistakes. You know, he denies Jesus and, and uh, Jesus at the end of that account after the resurrection says, do you love me? Yes, I do, then feed my sheep. Do you love me? Yes, I do, then feed my sheep. Do you? And it's that bookend of, of Peter denying Jesus the three times when Jesus is arrested. But when Jesus says that Peter is the rock and on this rock he will build his church, what kind of rock do you think of when Jesus says that? Do you think of a strong rock, a boulder, a cornerstone, a foundational layer of granite? That's the way I always pictured it. But you know me well enough at this point, you know that I'm about to twist it, don't you? Because Petros does mean rock. But it doesn't mean a big boulder. It doesn't mean a big cliff. Petra does. Kim, Keith, Petra means rock, right? right? Ichthus, Petra, the Christian rock band, famous in the 80s and 90s. Yeah, Petra means rock, big rock. Petros, translated as Peter in our text today, means a tiny little insignificant pebble that can easily be flicked. And Jesus says, and you are Peter, insignificant little rock, and upon you I will build my church. Mind blown. You mean it's not a source of strength? It's not a, no. So Jesus will build the church on something that is insignificant and not strong? That's what he said. So Peter got out of the boat even though he was terrified and Jesus saved him. The disciples were worried there wouldn't be enough food, but they tried. What does that mean for us? Well, rocks sink when they try to walk on water. But even the impossible can be done if we believe. Why did you not have enough faith? Even I could make a rock walk on water. But it's not about walking on water. It's about getting out of the boat. It's about having the faith to get out of the boat and realizing that our human efforts are not the cornerstone of the church. We are not the strength of the church. We are not called to hold the traditions up. We are not called to be the savior of the community. Our human efforts are not the cornerstone. Our humanity, the weaknesses that we hold, the brokenness that we have, our compassion, our love, the things that this work tells us, this world tells us are insignificant. Oh, those little pebbles are the very stuff the church is built upon. Our humanity, our weaknesses, our brokenness are trampled like stones under the feet of this world, but they can be transformed by Christ to be the very foundation of his presence here on earth. When we think of foundations, we think of, of concrete. Modern day buildings are, are, are built with Strong concrete foundations, rebar poured in, uh, holding everything together. But a concrete foundation is only as strong, uh, only as stable, only as level as its subgrade. Subbase, subgrade level is made of what? Gravel. What's gravel? Insignificant little stones. Without the insignificant little stones, the foundation of our greatest buildings would crack, would lean, and would not be stable because the little stones are able to do course corrections to help the overall strength of the building. Without them, the first major shift in a building, the, the major foundation itself would have too much strain, would be immovable, and therefore...
The ability to change, to shift, and adjust is what adds strength to the foundation. So you are Petros. You are Petros, the small, insignificant pebble. The very foundation of the church, which settles and cracks, unable to change or shift. So how does a small rock make the big difference? It takes the weight. It knows its place. It makes adjustments. It doesn't expect itself to do all the work. It knows that there are so many other little pebbles along the way that help. It doesn't have to bear the brunt of the weight by itself. It knows that it is part of a greater peace. Peter didn't fail. Peter didn't fail to trust or get out of the boat. The fact that he wasn't sure that Jesus was a ghost or not just adds to his courage, I think. It didn't matter whether or not he would sink. All rocks sink. It only mattered that he was willing to do something that terrified him. Think about that. He was willing to do something that scared him to death. Walking out in the dark water towards a ghost that he really hoped was really Jesus. Maybe the disciples weren't terrified when they helped feed the 5,000 people, but they were most definitely afraid of failing. But they did it anyway. They reached out into the realm of impossibility and kept a hold of Christ. So what are you afraid of this morning? What are you fearful of? of in your faith? Are you rendered immobile by a fear of failure? Because I hope what you heard in these texts this morning is that perfection is not an expectation. Maybe being a Christian means letting go of the fear of failure and instead choosing to be useful. Maybe being the church means we give up thinking of ourselves as the strong boulders and we become willing to be pebbles that create paths for others even being willing to be walked upon for Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.